Man, it was a tough, rough week. I tell you, between the feds and the CPI and the PPI and the interest rates overreacting, it's a tough week, man. We're already dealing with, man, come on, give us a break. We're already dealing with a recession. I mean, the commercial market's in a depression. Real estate's in a recession. We got high rates. We're getting our asses kicked out here. And then, boom, that 10-year shoots up. Rates way overdo it. And here we are. It's another week, my friends. And you know what? Do we believe the feds? Do we not? Hey, we even know. Even the feds are saying that data wasn't that far off. And they said, even the Fed members are saying, hey, we got to look at the you know, three months, the six months, we are coming down. Even the Fed's member know. They don't want that 10 year going back to five. That's a problem, guys. So we have to ask ourselves, are the Feds too data dependent? But also, they've literally changed their mind because they said when inflation comes down, they're gonna cut rates. And guess what, guys? Inflation's down. They look at PCE. PCE, when you look over month over month and three months, it's way down, guys. It's in line where they want. But we're getting all this other crazy data. And is, are they waiting for the jobs recession to hit? We got those unemployment numbers to spike? I don't know. But it's crazy. It's madness. We got to deal with it. But what, what else are we going to do? I know what we're going to do. This is the brief. We're going to talk about it. We're going to go through the rates, the inventory, all of it. So welcome back because it's another week. And if you guys didn't know, my name is Kenny Simpson. And just to remind you, I do residential financing. I focus on one to four. I'm also a data nerd. I'm also a content guy. And so if you're first time watching me, well, welcome. If it's your 10th time watching me, well, welcome back. I appreciate the support. Before we move on, we have exciting, exciting news that I want to bring to you. Yes, I'm just giving you a little teaser, a little bit of a, what do you want to call it? Exciting Things are ahead. That's what I'm saying. So anyways, guys, I am actually going to launch my own YouTube channel outside of getting the cash flow game, my own YouTube channel. And yes, I have learned how to launch the channel from some really good individuals. So hopefully I'll be putting out two videos a week on time scheduled. I don't know what day in March we'll be doing it, but we're building it out. It'll be getting done shortly. It'll be launching in the next couple of weeks two, three weeks. I'm excited. So it's going to be geared towards first time home buyers, mortgages, you know, real estate, things like that. So we'll still have to get in the cash flow channel. We'll still have get in the cash flow game podcast and we'll still have the brief, which you'll be able to watch on that channel. So stay tuned for that. Anyways, let's jump into it guys. Cause we're not here to talk about me. We're here to talk about the data, the news rates, real estate, and what the hell is going on out there, right? Let's be honest. So last week, for the national week over week, we had 494.862. This week, we're at 494.029. We are going down. We lost stuff nationally. How are we doing here locally? Well, locally, we had a pop up for the good. So we're new listings, 452, we're up 28%. Sold comps, 365, we're up 19%. And then all active listings, 2692, we're up 4%. So looking good, looking good. But look, rates are a mess. Like I told everybody, this ain't gonna be a straight da shot down, guys. It's not, why? Because the Fed has clearly told us they're stubborn, they're slow, they're old. And you know what? They just don't wanna pivot. They just don't wanna land that damn plane. Maybe they don't know how to land the plane. Maybe they're scared of landing the plane. Maybe we don't know what the hell they're gonna do. Maybe they're gonna freaking crash it. We don't know. But what I do know is that interest rates overreacted to more data. And the miss was not that big. Are we pulling in data from the, you know, from January? Is it coming over, still leaking over from the holidays? I don't know, maybe, who knows, whatever. But what I do know is that retail sales missed. And but what I also know is that three countries, countries, the countries, I think so. Japan, Germany. And they say Europe, but Europe's not a country with all those other countries. They are technically, what? In a recession. We've missed a recession. China's in a recession. So the US is not, we're moving forward. But we've also, are close to a recession, not close to a recession. Retail sales are down. You know, jobs market's good. Are we gonna have a recession when people start getting laid off? They're announcing layoffs, more people are getting laid off. I don't know, guys, but a lot of countries in a recession. We're still having a good economy, whatever that is. Is it really real or not? We just don't know. But it's very interesting. Other countries are going to a technical recession and we're sitting here. What else is going on? 
are feds playing with fire? Are they, because the reason why I say this is what are they waiting for? Because they told us when PCE, they would make a move. So they're not comfortable. They are really scared about cutting too soon. But what if they cut too late? Because we know they like to be late to the party. They like to show up to the party when everybody's a little buzz, when everybody's having a little bit of fun, when the party's halfway done with alcohol, right? Maybe you've already met food. They like to come in and, you know, late, make an entrance. I don't know. Are they going to cut March off the table? Is May off the table? Are they going to cut in June? Are they going to kick the can down the road? I don't know. It's crazy. We would love some rate cuts because it might help housing. It might help get some inventory because we're still lacking inventory like crazy. But what are you going to do? What else is going on out there? You know, for a lot of y'alls, for first time home buyers, people that are refinancing, but let's just talk about the first time home buyers. There's a lot of deals falling out, my friends. Some people get approved at the bank, a direct lender, maybe a mortgage broker. And look, we're not all the same. We're not. That bank guy could have come right out of college. He's six months into this. He can't get your deal done. Then guess what? You get referred to Kenny, who's a 20-year veteran mortgage broker. That's like a samurai. That's like a ninja. That's ready to come in and dominate. That's what we do. So a lot of deals falling out because the lack of experience of who they're talking to happens all the time, guys. Do you have the right team? Do you have the right loan officer? Do you have the right realtor? It's a big deal. It's tough out there. If you're self-employed, if you change jobs, if you're W-2'd, if you get committed, whatever it is, you might have a complicated scenario. If you're not working with somebody that has an array of products, an array of knowledge, and knows how to get stuff done, you can find yourself in escrow with a denial and scrambling stressed out of your mind. So make sure, number one, that you are going with somebody that understands your situation, they vetted it, not just said, oh, yeah, I looked at everything, you look good, here's your pre-approval, no, no, no. If they don't know everything, if they're not confident, did they call their underwriter? Did they call the investor? Did they call the head underwriter? Did they triple check? They're sure. Are they really, really sure? Because if not, you're the one that gets screwed. Yeah, you can call them and vent and complain and bitch and moan. You're the one that didn't close. You're the one that might lose your deposit. You're the one that now is like, I just gave my 30 day notice. So work with somebody that knows what they're doing that can get you to the finish line. If something comes up, they have experience with that something. So that's why unfortunately working with experienced loan officers does make a difference in this game called buying a house, buying real estate, just getting it done. You know, I work with a lot of real estate investors. I work with a lot of business owners, work with a lot of sole proprietors, self-employed. And so I'm very familiar with that income. I'm very familiar with what lenders to go to. I'm very familiar with guidelines. I'm very familiar with where how we can get exceptions. And I'm also very familiar with what to ask for, how to talk to you guys, how to get it done, how to make it happen. But the big problem is, is that a lot of self-employed borrowers are not getting pre-approved properly. They're not getting the right products. So here's, let me give you a tip. Even if you're a loan officer, I'm gonna help you out today. I'm gonna help you out even if you're a first time home buyer. Here is one thing that you need to know if you're self-employed. Number one major, major rule. If you have a complicated file, a complicated file could be like, I'm a real estate investor, Kenny, and I own a bunch of property. I'm a, I have 10 companies. I, I went W-2 to self-employed. I got, you know, my wife's W-2 to I'm self-employed. I show losses, whatever it is. If you're complicated and that loan officer took your file and they looked at it and said, you're good to go. You're banking on that. But loan officer, are you really, really good to go? Because a lot of deals fall apart. Because just because you think you're good to go, you might've missed something. Does the DTI work? Do they have enough reserves? Are you going full doc? Are you going bank statements? Are you going PL? Are you going DSCR? Is it investment? Whatever it is. If you don't have a loan officer that has the ability to take your file and go bring it to a head underwriter to address all these issues and get back to you, that's an issue. They should be telling you this up front. I tell myself a little buyers, hey, I'm gonna take your file, we're gonna look at it. If I have any questions after my 20 years, if I don't know 100% that this is gonna get done, I will call a head underwriter, I will call multiple lenders. Hell, we'll even call the investor that they're gonna sell this to to make sure they can do this deal. That's why we close deals here at the Simpsons team. That's the expectation you should have as a self-employed 
borrower, whether you're buying or refining, but especially if you're buying, because you have a done to your head because it's a ticking time bomb of when you gotta close, when you gotta move contingencies, you're already stressed, you're already insecure, you're already in fear, because you're not sure it's gonna happen, because maybe you got denied somewhere, or maybe you know your situation stuff. How do we knock those all out is make sure that loan officer, that lender is taking it to the right person, getting all those questions answered. So when you put in the offer, you wire in your funds, we can get it in underwriting, get the appraisal back, get the approval, clear to close, get docs, get the keys for you, and you're moved in. That's simple sounding, but it's not always done correctly, and it turns out to be a disaster. So don't be a disaster. Make sure your loan officer is willing to do all that, and they should be doing that on any file that they're not 100% on. That's facts right there. Just point it out. Just be honest. All right. So what are some of the challenges self-employed buyers? Yes. This week I'm talking about use your self-employed buyers. I always say use. I don't know why. I feel like, is that from the East coast or something? Where do I get this stuff from? I don't even know. Trying to be funny, but I don't even know if it's funny because we got to be serious here. So what are the products that I'm helping with a lot of self-employed buyers? Why do we need them? Why do they need them? Um, why do we need them? Why do they need us to need them? Does that even make any sense? I don't even know. But the point is, is let's go through them. Number one, we've got full doc. Let's go here. Full doc. Number two, we've got bank savings. We've got 24 months, 12 months. Yeah, there could be some programs six months, but that's we're going standard. That's the typical. Number three, we have bank statements plus W-2. So if you're self-employed and we got to use your bank statements and your wife over here, see that Mr. Miyagi wax on, wax off, and your wife over here is W-2, we can combine you guys and have a good dance and make it happen. Yes, we can use W-2 and bank statements. And yes, you could be W-2 and you can have a side hustle, folks, because some of us have side hustles. It's okay. And the side hustle makes money. Maybe the side hustle's Uber, you drive on the weekends because you wanted to save up money to buy a house because I've had customers, so kudos to you for doing that. So we've got, we got here we go, we got W-2, we got bank statement, we got W-2 and bank statement, we got profit and loss, that means we get a profit and loss from your CPA. If you don't have one, we send them your stuff and another CPA gives us a profit and loss, gives us the breakdown, and you can buy a house that way. So those are the full doc. Oh, wait, 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 one more. So full doc, bank statement, W-2 bank statement, p &L. And last but not least, we can do one year tax returns. Yeah, folks, one year tax returns. That's Fannie and Freddie, as long as you get that approval. And then we have other, other lenders that will do one year as well. So you have five different options there. And then if we're talking about, if you're a real estate investor, we could do all those, right? All those, but also we have a six over here, which we can do a DSCR loan, which stands for debt coverage service ratio. So if I just lost you there, I probably did. What that means is we use the property's income as long as it covers enough of the mortgage, there's a certain ratio, it's a one to one or over that. That means if your mortgage is 3,000, your rent's 3,500, you would cover. If your mortgage is 4,000, your rent's 3,500, you don't cover. Could we still get it done? Yes, the rate would be impacted. So those are the six ways we help real estate investors get them done. Yes, there's people that have to go full doc and they're complicated and can't have all these tax returns and bonus appreciation and all this stuff. If you didn't understand what I said, then that's not you. If you did understand, yes, we deal with you too, folks. We know how to get them done. So just make sure you're working with the right person because not everybody has six options in their wheelhouse to help you out with all your financing needs. One last thing I want to say too about the self-employed is you never know until you give us a shot. Hey, what are you talking about? You go, well, Kenny, I talked to Bob over here and Bob says I don't qualify full doc. Well, I don't know, Bob. And maybe Bob's wrong. And maybe Bob works at a bank that's really conservative. Because guess what? I've been doing this 20 years. And you know how many times somebody called me and said Bob couldn't get their deal done? Or Gary over at the bank? Or Karen or Susan or whoever you are? Sorry, Bob, Karen, Susan. No offense to you. I'm sure you closed plenty of loans. But you've told my clients no, and I've got them right. Because you have different guidelines, different restrictions. You don't use this. You don't add this back. So what I say is when you call me and say, I can't qualify full doc, and I need to go bank statement or stated, how do you know? Give me a shot. Don't lose hope. Send me your tax returns. Let me look. Because a lot of times we can, for real estate investors, make it happen. They just don't understand that I know a lot about this stuff because I work with a lot of real estate investors. So anyways, just pointing that out, that if you're a real estate investor, maybe you want to buy your first time home and that's how you get your income, right? Or you're buying it up home or something like that, or yourself. It could be the self-employed. 
give me a shot. Give me the tax returns. Let me look at it. Let me tell you no before we move over to the next options, right? That we talked about of buying a property. So this topic comes up a lot, but Housing Wire wrote an article about it. So a lot of first time home buyers, a lot of people that own homes currently, you know what they don't understand? They don't really understand how their escrow account works. And what is an escrow account? So that means every month, let's say your payment's 3,500 bucks. Pick it around number. Let's say $2,800 goes to principal and interest. 200 go to insurance, 500 goes to taxes. So the 200 and the 500, which equals 700, that all goes into an impound account, an escrow account that gets packed, saved. And then when that tax bill gets due, that lender pays it. When that insurance gets billed due, what happens? That lender pays it. They handle that for you. But a lot of you guys, you're like, Kenny, I don't understand the escrow account. I understand, it doesn't make any sense. So Housing Wire, they wrote an article about it. So I'm like, let's see what they have to say about it. So. Here we go. They say among homeowners who have a mortgage escrow accounts, only 52, 52% of you understand it. What? We got to get that number up to. We've got to get it up. More than 80% of surveyors that said they know what an escrow account is and its primary purpose to pay the property tax expenses, such homeowners insurance, flood insurance, mortgage insurance, correct? Conduct this survey is a thousand people. And how do they know this? Because they get a lot of calls. 60% of calls, one of the servicer that where you call the mortgage savings a servicer was about escrow accounts. 80% of mortgage accounts have an escrow, which is good. So after reading this article, what did I find out? 80% of mortgage people have an impound account, which is smart. 60% of a lot of those servicing related calls have to do with escrow accounts. And people are kind of like, wait a minute, why does my escrow account jump? Why does it go up? They don't understand it. So let me break it down. Number one, the principal and interest on your mortgage 30 year fix right here. Remember wax on this one right here. That's fixed. Principal, principal, interest fixed. It's not changing taxes and insurance. It's not fixed insurance can go up. If you're in California, guess what? Your insurance is probably going up. And guess what? If it goes up, what happens to your escrow account every month? It goes up. Why? Because if your insurance was $2,400, remember $200 a month, and it's 3000 Now they got to collect whatever. It's 250 bucks a month. And taxes, if in taxes go up or down, yes, they could go down. 2008, nine, when that happened, taxes went down. Gotcha. You didn't know that could happen. It could. Your taxes could go up or down. That would change. So people go, why is this changing? It's not fixed, folks. It's got to change because if it doesn't change, then you get behind. So let me go through a couple of things. Number one is if you get a tax bill and it changes, you should call them and make sure they got it too and your insurance alert them. Because what's going to happen, folks, is that a couple of things. Your tax to get due, you might get whacked with a one time. What do you mean I got to pay you two extra grand? Or they bump up your monthly thing to catch you up. So make sure you don't get hit with a one time hit. And then they're going to get that monthly up there. So they've got to balance this out. If you ever overpay into your escrow account, they don't let the money sit in there. They will refund it back. You can request it back. But keep in mind, taxes, insurance will change, can change. And if they do, that would change your payment on your mortgage. Here's an interesting fact just to leave your renters with as I wrap up this brief. So the apartment boom. So if you're outside your city, if you're here in San Diego, you're driving around, you're saying, wow, they're building a lot of apartments in some cities, it's out of control. Here's what's happening. There's good and there's bad news. The good news is, is that means there's more competition and prices should go down. Cool for you renter, because you're gonna score and save some money. The bad news is, is that eventually that boom, which they say in this article from Housing Wire, and I know Logan's been talking about this and he wrote this article on the podcast. I've been saying this before too, is that eventually when rates are this high, cost to get a construction is this high, the apartment boom is winding down. So anybody that has a project going or you know knee deep into it, they're gonna finish it. But if there's land and people are gonna build, they're putting that as a hold. They're not interested in paying nine, you know, when the 10 to 12, 13% to build the project plus low leverage. So not gonna do it. So what's gonna happen is we're gonna build all, all this stuff will come to the market. It will eventually get filled up and all your renters are like, woo, we got a good deal. And then what happens just like 2008 is did you, meant, did you hear what I mentioned before? We stopped building. So population keeps growing and people keep moving to these certain cities where they're building. So eventually you're gonna get in there, you're gonna fill it up and then competition goes away because nobody's building. And guess what happens when that happens? Supply demand reverses, my friends. And the supply goes down and the demand goes up and your rent's gonna go up. So 
For the next couple of years, enjoy it while rents come down. But after that, because we're gonna have supply demand issues, because the Fed screwed up and they jacked rates too low, then they jacked rates too high, they screwed all the builders. Yes, I'm blaming you feds because you're driving the ship on interest rates. So you are responsible for this at the end of the day. And you're the one that should be helping with housing, right? With interest rates, all this. So they're gonna create this boom and bust for renters, meaning the boom's gonna be like, hey, we got all this new supply. You're gonna get great deals. You're gonna get a new thing, a new, a new place. You're gonna get a deal. And then a couple of years from now, that's over and rents are gonna go start going back up. So if you wanna avoid that, how do you do that? Buy a home so you don't have to play the rent game. If you're okay at the rent game, then be a renter. It's okay. But if you don't wanna keep moving around and playing the rent game, then be a homeowner. And, and you know what? Then maybe house hack and go buy a couple units. Do you live in one and rent out the others and know that rents are going to keep going up and you can keep getting a raise and have people help pay your mortgage? Well, folks, that's it for me this week on Brief. It's been real. It's been good. Happy President's Day as I shoot this. And you might be enjoying the day off. Hope you are. In San Diego, it looks like we're getting some more rain here as I look outside. But anyways, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Hope you guys learned something. I always do when I create this. Until next week watching the data and let's my toes are crossed too that rates come down talk to you then